Hello, I'm Christian R. Pinto, a proud NASA MUST student ambassador and senior aerospace engineering student at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Last year, while on my summer internship at the Kennedy Space Center, I came across this document, which is the National Space Policy of the United States of America. The policy, one of the policy's major goals, is to land humans on an asteroid by the year 2025. As an SMA student ambassador, I'm always seeking for opportunities to reach out to future generations of STEM disciplines, as well as if, encourage other students like myself to do the same. This inspired me to choose Professor Bogdan Udreya's Senior Aerospace Engineering Detail class at our university, which involves placing a satellite on an asteroid's orbit. Today, our senior engineering team is going to show exactly what entails this project. In addition to being senior aerospace engineering students, Mr. Paul Anderson is also a co-op student at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Hey, how are you? Joey Kampf is also a student assistant at the Aerospace Engineering Department in Air at Embry-Riddle. Yep. Tess Deffinger is also a Student Government Association College of Engineering representative. Leila Gerenser is a cadet lieutenant at the Colonel Air Force ROTC program. Hello. Lauren Gully is president of Alpha Z Delta Sorority. Hey guys. Par Patel is a senior at just 19 years old with a dual concentration in astronautics and propulsion. Hi there. Robbie Phillips is president of Action Sports Team. What's up everyone? Rodrigo Sears, computer science minor. How you doing? And Professor Bogdan Udrea worked at the European Space Agency prior to coming to Ember Riddle and is also our senior project instructor. Hi all. Hi. Professor Dreyer, please describe the project's origin. Well, I have to start with the way we uh, perform the design uh, class in here at Ember Riddle. We uh, have a number of students working on uh, a certain satellite or a certain space project and we're trying to divide uh, the project into uh, teams dealing or designing systems of their interest. For example, in a spacecraft we have, as we all know, a propulsion system, a power system, a uh, guidance navigation control system, and part of the space mission is also a trajectory design or mission analysis in terms of uh, designing the trajectory or the orbit of the uh, specific spacecraft. This group that you see here is made of students interested in orbital mechanics. They look for a challenge, and at the beginning of the year, I threw them that challenge that actually came uh, around as a lunchtime discussion at JPL last summer where uh, we, discussed peop uh, we discussed various methods of um, estimating the torques and the forces on uh, a space probe that's going to explore uh, various asteroids, uh, specifically near-Earth asteroids that are of interest to both NASA and the commercial uh, enterprises. Uh, I asked these folks to actually uh, study the methods described in a paper by uh, JPL researchers and try to expand that research in order to either obtain more accurate gravitation models or uh, gravitation models of asteroids that can be easily run on the onboard computer for providing more autonomy for the respective probe. So that summarizes it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Tess, what specific research has been done in this project thus far? At the beginning of our research, uh, we looked at a lot of different papers, especially the JPL one that Professor Udrea mentioned earlier. Uh, we also used a database of asteroid models for inversion techniques. This database contains over a hundred of different asteroid shapefiles. A shapefile is basically a file that contains hundreds to a thousand uh, different points. These points can be connected, like connect the dots, and once they're connected, they can form an asteroid like this. Thank you. Lauren, please explain the tools used in this project thus far. The primary tool we used is called MATLAB, and it stands for Matrix Laboratory. Uh, and we used it for numerical computations um, that are normally hard to do or lengthy to do by hand. We can also generate images of the asteroid and plots, like the gravitational field plots uh, we have. The second program we used is called FEMAP, which stands for Finite Element Model and Post-Processing. And we use that to generate um, our truth model that we use to compare to our other models to see how accurate it is. Thank you. Joey, please describe the project's purpose and objective. Well, the main purpose is um, to reduce the risks of failure of um, satellite missions to 
celestial bodies such as asteroids and comets. And uh, those missions mainly to retrieve samples which have had previous incidences in the past. Now, the way we do this is that we're creating an algorithm uh, using a program to reduce the calculation time and make it efficiently to calculate the gravity field of said body. So we calculate the gravitational field in order to model an orbit around it safely, away from it, and that way we assure uh, mission safety. Now, the way we do that, in order to calculate the gravity field, we have to um, first model its geometry. Now, an asteroid has a random geometry, so we went from a simpler, we took a simpler approach, approach by um, filling it up with smaller shapes which are easier to model with, such as a sphere. A sphere has uh, constant gravity all around it. So we took the smallest spheres and started putting in, filling it up basically. In a similar manner, like I can fill up this cup to model its geometry, I can fill it up with all these gumballs and then add them all up. And we got the geometry of this cup using smaller, easier to compute um, geometries. So, in essence, being that the gumballs are easier to work. Okay, very good. Thank you. Paul, I understand that there are two methods to this project, the finite element and the variable element. Can you please describe the finite element approach? Well, sure. Actually, both of these approaches rely on a technique called finite element modeling, in which we try to represent the shape of the asteroid by packing it with uniform elements of a known gravitational potential, elements that are easier to compute. And so by doing this, we can get a rough approximation of the geometry of the asteroid that is very useful for creating our gravitational field approximation. So in the first approach, the finite element approach, I use constant spheres of a predetermined density. At first, in a grid lattice structure, kind of like this. Now we can see that there are plenty of little holes in this arrangement. So in order to increase the packing density and also enhance the accuracy of our model, we implement an offsetting scheme known as the hexagonal close pack or cannonball stack, such as this shown here. And if you went to the supermarket, you'd probably find oranges stacked like this. So by using this technique, we're able to approximate very well the internal geometry of an examined asteroid and use that as a very concise tool for estimating the gravity field that it creates. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, okay. Par, please describe the project's variable element approach. Well, as opposed to the finite element models, the variable element models are robust and very complex optimization problem. What they adapt is filling an asteroid with finite size spheres, whereas we had two main categories under which we classify our variable element models. It is also because of this flexible nature of ellipsoids that they can be stretched in all three directions. It makes the optimization problem more complex because now we have to constrain all three directions x, y, z and make sure the ellipsoid is not going outside of the asteroid. Well, this model is not currently active. We are still working on the model or the code for implementing it and the gravitational acceleration. Thank you. Rodrigo, what were some of the major challenges that you encountered in this project and how did you deal with them? Well, the major uh, challenge we encountered in this project was uh, coming up with a way to get 100% volume. Well, as previously mentioned, we were using constant size spheres to, f to, fill into, uh, to fill up the asteroid. Originally, our first approach was using the grid-like structure, and once we did that, we got a result of 55%. That's not good enough in order to get the gravitational potential, so we then proceeded to use the cannonball-like structure. Once we did that, we got a 74% uh, volume. After, uh, after some research, we found out that in 1611, the mathematician Johannes Kepler tried the similar, uh, tried the similar experiments and came up that came up that the maximum volume that you could accomplish is 74% while changing the, the arrangement of the spheres. So after we found this out, we then just proceeded to use smaller spheres into the remaining gaps. And after that, we, aim, we came up with a 99% volumetric efficiency. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Robbie, what unexpected challenges did you encounter in this project and how did you deal with them? Well, for those of us who worked on the variable sphere model, we were challenged with turning a seemingly intuitive problem that you would visualize in your head into a purely mathematical problem that can be solved with a calculator or computer or whatever software package you have available. We use MATLAB. Now, that entails us sitting down and discussing an appropriate algorithm which solves a problem step by step using computational geometry in this instant to solve the problem, which is filling up the asteroid 
with the largest possible spheres, as you can see I racket balls, and then in the interstitial vacancies, filling it with smaller spheres. So we get succeedingly smaller spheres. Now, our current variable sphere model is incapable of achieving a full approximation of the asteroid geometry. And this is so because no matter how we pack these spheres, bigger than smaller and smaller, no matter how small they get, there will always be some space unaccounted for. Now, an alternative approach was the variable ellipsoid model. So think of shapes like an egg or a football, not necessarily a sphere. We use that because they're more adaptable and can consume more volume and thus use fewer elements. This introduces a higher degree of complexity to the problem. So we had to optimize the number of parameters without letting these ellipsoids fall out of the asteroid. That's the problem. We can't quite get them to fit inside of the asteroid. So we're improving our models to assure a higher accuracy, thus to get a highly accurate gravity field model. Leila, where does this project lead our group in space exploration? Our future goal is ultimately to plan a mission to the asteroid. Manned or unmanned, this requires a lot of thought and research. Our first step would be actually to use orbital mechanics of small rigid bodies to approximate the speed and attitude of the spacecraft landing on the asteroid. Now, the gravitational field of the asteroid is only a stepping stone towards the direction of actually landing on the asteroid. We hope to accomplish this task within the next couple of months or even continuing it on into the future. Please visit intern.nasa.gov for internship, scholarship, and fellowship opportunities. Go, Go to